to worship and pair our hearts this morning to worship.
the Lord, and I shall be with Israel, and our country and the military, and I shall be with all those who couldn't be with us for whatever reason, Lord. And I shall be with those who are going on vacation, Lord. And I ask Jesus to be with uh, us as we take up this offering that may be used for your honor and glory. And I ask to be with the preacher as you bring some message you would have in the brain. And I ask this all in your Lord of name. Amen.
You gotta get the hold of it. The old man is dead. Your life has changed from the inside out. Amen. Andrew, if you have it, forget it. Andrew, Andrew uh, Sunday night before last, I believe, you would play it. Yeah. Play amazing. Turn off. There we go. Play amazing grace. And uh, then he uh, was singing songs. And he'll be in the preacher for long. <laughs> Take over. And uh, we appreciate Andrew for doing that. Uh, as well. I want you to do something for me. I want everybody just to wave at me. Make sure you're all awake this morning. Amen. There you go. Praise the Lord. That's good. We get outside yesterday, we had a good time going to the golf tournament. Uh, we had uh, 47 players, 12 teams that came to play. And then we had a lot of some business that sponsored our tournament as well. And then we raised some funds for our projectors. And uh, hopefully we got uh, close to enough now. And we'll be, the next coming weeks, our leadership team and the church will hopefully have something in place. Or, or log, you can look on the screen or you can use the handbook again, either way. So, I do thank those. I want to thank several people who shared. I want to thank her. She did a lot of the uh, gifts and surprise, uh, prizes for all the golfers and going around these businesses and begging and pleading with them for goodies and uh, gifts, certificates, and things like that. That's a hard job to do. I also want to thank Ms. Belusta. She was helping ride around yesterday, and Joey and others, and Bruce. And he was here, but I think he's well, feeling good. Oh, there he is in the back. You know, moved back, uh, moved back to the important seats. <laughs> And uh, he was uh, there to help us today as well. And many of y'all helped as well praying and giving and, and getting things to work out for the golf tournament. Thank you. We had a great day. Uh, it's kind of amazing when we get there and they said it's supposed to be a severe storm like it happened Friday night. They were about 3 o'clock. And close to 3 o'clock, shortly enough, the clouds were real dark, fixed to come. And it felt like it was going to, uh, the twisters coming down, probably, or something. We didn't know. But, uh, Moved around the golf course away. It may have sprinkled just for a few seconds, and one little lightning storm, lightning that was in. And then about an hour later, it came another storm. It moved the other direction, went around. And so we had pretty weather, had a good time. Do appreciate all those who participated, those who played, and got teams together. So thank you very much. It's all bear too. We sure did. Eight feet tall, black bear coming running across. I caught. I try to get out there and get myself to play with it. No, no. There's all kind of things you see at the golf course. You're not careful. You don't know where you go, right? <laughs> so, so, but we had a good time, so thank you very much. So that's why I want you to wave your hands. I'll make sure y'all went to sleep in my car was trying to get, to get all that sun. And so, if you got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 11. We're looking at. The story of Lazarus. We started uh, probably a couple of weeks ago on this series uh, in, in John chapter 11, focusing on Lazarus. We looked at the purpose and plan of God. We're about waiting on God. We looked at chapter 11, verse the first 16 verses. Sometimes we had to wait. Jesus came four days later, and we had to wait on God. Oh, the purpose and the plan of God waiting to come. And so today, I want to just look at the conversation between. Jesus and Martha. Next week we'll look at Jesus and Mary, and then we'll see the uh, outcome of the uh, what happens as you know Jesus Lazarus comes back to life later on in this passage. But I want to begin with this question: What is one of the greatest disappointments in life that you faced? You don't have to answer. Just think about it. What is some of the greatest disappointments or the greatest disappointment you faced in life? We were honest with ourselves. We could always say there's things we're, we're disappointed with. People disappoint us. Things that we buy disappoint us. Uh, we, uh, this, the situations we're in, the environment we're in, disappoint us. Maybe a failed marriage is disappointing. Maybe there was uh, not being there to love someone when you wish you had. It was too late. Maybe uh, being a workaholic and not being around your family and you just get over in years and think, man, I wish I had that time back. Maybe it was uh, uh, not serving the Lord at some point in life and you were out with someone else. Maybe it's telling those who you love you wish you could tell them over again instead of hurting them. Maybe you wish you wasn't a prodigal child or uh, as we saw in, in the book of Luke. Maybe uh, someone's hurt you in your actions of how you responded. You wish you could take back. 
Maybe it's being involved in alcohol, drugs, or a negative lifestyle that you wish it exists. There's disappointments in how we face. But I'm thankful that Jesus is God and He overcomes those things that we have faced. We see here in this passage in, in, in uh, John chapter 11, beginning with verse number 17. If you're able to stand, I'll read God's Word. Would you please stand? The Bible says that when Jesus came, He found that He had already been in the tomb four days. This is my Lazarus. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met Him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if, it had been, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I have know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that you will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. That's correct. Father, we come to you today. We thank you again for blessing us, allowing us to worship you, come together and pray together, spend time together, and spend the Word together. God, help us to pull from these past, from this past of scriptures and nuggets of a truth that will help us in our daily walk. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. May be seated. I can't help but thank Martha. I was Martha, and Jesus came late. That song, four days late, he came, right? I would be disappointed. Jesus built a, built a close relationship between Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. By the time, many times you see in the scriptures where they spend time together, and he comes to the other house because they would take Jesus in. Most of the people would not because they would see Jesus as a heretic or because people hated him and because riots. They, they wanted peace in their home. And they built a close bond. But then Jesus didn't show up. Did he not care? Jesus, where are you? What happened? We sent word. And in four days, he's already been in the dead. He's already been put grave clothes on. He's already been sealed. People have already come and mourn and did the funeral. And here you come showing up and all this has been done. He's gone. He's dead. But yet, Jesus proves otherwise. In every culture, there's an explanation of what happens to people after life. Uh, Islam teaches a future paradise for martyrs of their cause. Hinduism teaches the purifying of the soul through a million reincarnations and the hope for a future nirvana. As Christians, we are confident in the victory of hope of death based on Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life. And when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life, he who believes in me yet, he lived, yet shall he die, yet shall he live. Martha responds in this passage, yes, I know the day of the resurrection he will be restored in the uh, 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 last day shall come back to life. But that's not what Jesus was talking about here. He was wanting to show that he is God. He is God, right? In this passage, we look at the fifth I am. There's seven I am's in the book of in the, in the Gospels of John. We looked at I am the bread of life in chapter 6. We look at the, at the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world in chapter 8. We look at Jesus being the door. I am the door in chapter 10. And also in chapter 10, we look at him being, I am the good shepherd who takes care of his sheep. But here we see, I am the resurrection and the light. This is something that Jesus himself can do that no other gods or other religions could say. That he is the resurrection and the light. And the lie. No other statements from other religions or beliefs about this. 
because only he has defeated death, hell, and the grave. So today I want to share with you four quick points of this passage. First of all, between between Jesus and Mark, first of all, Jesus Jesus' compassion, his compassion for the family. And Bethany was basically a suburb of Jerusalem. It's about two miles away from uh, Jerusalem where he was traveling. And Jesus arrived and he, and he already knew that Jesus, that Lazarus had been dead. Now typically, with Mary and Martha, when they find out that Lazarus is dying or sick, they send a messenger. That's one day. And then it takes a day to come back, two days. But the Bible teaches us that he's probably stayed around two days before he traveled on the fourth day. And so we see here, he didn't actually enter into Bethany. He actually was on the outskirts of Bethany. And he sent a messenger to Martha and Mary that he has arrived. Now we don't know exactly why he was not actually there in Bethany at the time. Maybe because there were great crowds following them. Because there were Jews and all that who wanted to persecute or to try to, to capture him. And he, it, it was causing a big commotion in, in the city. But we know that what the Bible says here that Martha, as soon as she heard verse 20, that Jesus was coming, he went, she went and met him while Mary was sitting. And we just know this comparison contrast from Mary and Martha. We see when Jesus was being uh, worshipped, Mary, the other passage of Luke, where she pointed his head to the oil, Martha was over in the kitchen to work. He said, She's been over here working with, with me. Martha was one of those go getters, work, work, being active, being involved, being busy, while Mary was worshiping. We see here the same picture. Mary is going out to meet Jesus and is trying to get the situation resolved and then working with her hands and doing stuff. And here's Mary, she's sitting. Basically, the idea was she was at home as mourners came and came to greet. Uh, Mary was there to greet the mourners and those who had come to see about Lazarus. While Mary, Martha was trying to uh, fix things. Uh, and so we, we see here, Jesus had compassion. He came to them. He left Jerusalem and came to where they were. But He did it four days later. He did it later. Uh, and so we see here, compassion. Now, an application point for us in verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that they'd already been in the tomb four days. God can revive our dreams, our dead dreams. We get to the point where we feel like it all ends or gone. Everything is done. There's nothing we can do. We have to move on. We have to leave this behind. God, you tell it's the passion. God gave you a passion and desire for a ministry in the church or in the community. And everything you turn around, it's like everything, the doors are shutting, closing, and you're trying everything. And you feel like all hope is lost. To the point where you had no fun, you had no money, you had no need. You know, everything's just, it's just closed up dry. I mean, and it's not working out. Here's the same picture. Remember last week is sick. They go sin for Jesus. Jesus comes, hangs around for a few days, comes back. He was already legally dead. As I told you, in the Jewish uh, custom is basically waiting the fourth day legally is pronounced someone to be dead because the soul leaves at that point. Uh, Jesus uh, arrived after Lazarus' illness and resulted in leaving the body. He arrives after the, after the profession, after the mourners are gone. He arrives after they had been, been bound up and Garments to cloth at the graveside, you can at the stone stone been uh, covered, uh, and prepared. And matter of fact, by the way, talks about uh, Mary or Martha says he already stinks. He stinks. That it's already uh, it decayed. It's too late, Jesus. Wait a minute. Jesus is God. And God can do anything he wants. All things are possible through God. Application for us. What does this message mean for us about this passage? God wants maximum glory out of our situations. If He had come the day that He was sick, they could have said, the doctors helped me with the medicine. 
and forgotten about Jesus. If he was sick and got better, oh, I just took some better health for myself. God wanted to make sure that there's an impossible way for anybody to get the glory but Himself. Maybe there's a situation or a ministry or a desire that you have and you feel like it's dead and you can't, it won't work. You feel like all ends are gone, four days late. But maybe only God wants to bring the glory and give you glory for seeing God do something revive in your life. God shows up. Guess what? He shows out. If God shows up, He shows out. God says up in the church, we want to show out. And what more? To give Him glory. Him glory. Not for us, not for selfish gain. So Jesus has compassion on His family. He comes to them. Secondly, we see this. Martha's complaining. Jesus' is compassion. Martha's complaining. Verse 21 22. It says, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that you that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Did, you, did Martha believe that Jesus could heal Lazarus? Yes. Does Martha believe her? Yes. Did Martha have faith that Jesus could heal? Yes. Did her faith believe in trusting completely? No. She was limited in her faith. She knew who Jesus was. She saw the miracles, signs, and wonders. But she assumed because someone is dead, it was too late. Too late. Too late. Martha did believe in Jesus, but her faith was a complaining faith. You ever have a problem? We have faith in God, God, you need to fix this problem. None of us complaining here. I know that. That's good. Right? We're all happy, go lucky people, love people, love all people, right? But here we see Martha, a person who walked with God, spent time with the actual God Himself. It was just see him, her being human. You know what that means? We fail in our flesh because of sin, because of the environment, because of the world, because of the devil. And we have a tendency to rely on things that we have we see and not believe because of faith. She didn't put her rest on faith in God. And Jesus came and Jesus said, He said, I'm going to uh, your brother will rise again, said verse 23. She believed it, but it was limited. Yeah, sometimes we're the same way, aren't we? We believe God in things that we're limited in, in what God does. We limit God. But God, all things are possible. We limit God. We, we trust God for things, but we're not convinced that it will happen. She wasn't convinced that the best thing for happen, the best thing to happen for, for uh, the family was for Lazarus to die. She wanted to save him before it happened. So sometimes we don't understand God and we don't understand why things happen. But then you think about this. This is what complaining does for us. When we complain, we question God's faith. We become limited. In a sense, this. Jesus knows what's best in our lives, doesn't he? And Jesus is in control, isn't he? Why do we complain? We do this in Sunday school, by the way. So if you want to Sunday school you get a double dose. Uh, we're doing the, the wilderness wanderings in, in Exodus chapter, in chapter 15 and 16. They pass the Red Sea, cross the sea, and the first thing you know it, they're complaining because they're thirsty. They complain to Moses. Great many people complain, complain, complain. Moses says, you know, hey, didn't God just bring us out of the Red Sea? I mean, didn't God just do this? If he could do that, he'd take care of us. What does Moses do? Moses just gets to the Lord to praying. And God provides place of Edom where water, tons of water, palm trees are. You know, when we complain, we miss out on God's blessings at times. In chapter 16 of Exodus, next thing you know, a month later, here they are complaining because they're hungry. Our, our companies control us, don't they? They're on the clock. Preachers, hurry up. It's almost 12. 
right? I, I hear you. I hear you. Com complaining doesn't give God glory and bless us. Because God's in control. You know, complaining is a sin. You know that? It's a sin. It's wrong. Bible says, do all things without complaining and arguing. Philippians 2, 14. That's what we say a lot in our house. We mark, we mark it down so we can continue to remember it. Your preacher has to remember it from time to time too. And, but the more I memorize that verse, the less I do it, the more I trust God. Because God's in control. And we complain about others. We complain about the church. We complain about the job. We complain about situations. We just go to the Lord in prayer. And say, God, you're in control. Help me through this. Provide for my needs. Provide for my provisions. Provide for my finances. Provide for my family. Provide for my marriage. Provide for... You know what I'm saying? If we spend time praying with God, walking and talking with God, we have less time complaining. So who is it Martha complaining? But God's going to do a great mighty thing if she would just watch. So we see Jesus' compassion, Martha's complaining, and then the third point I want you to see is Martha's confusion. She was confused when Jesus said to her in verse 23, 23 or verse 25, or 23, so Jesus said, oh, your brother will rise again. She said, what did she say? I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She was confused. Jesus was really saying, right now, I'm going to bring him back to life. But she was fundamental, she had a fundamental faith. She knew the doctors, the teachings, and the promises of a new a heaven, a new earth, a new body, being resurrected one day, being in the presence of God in heaven. She knew that's a fundamental faith. And in believing in Jesus Christ, we have that promise of belief and faith that we'll be saved, we'll be in heaven with him one day. But she did not have a fulfilled faith. Her her faith was not fulfilled. She was disappointed because she still wanted her brother to be around. She didn't want to wait until the day when she's up in heaven too. She wanted her brother to be with her. She wanted him to be alive and the family to be together again. I'm sure some of you have lost loved ones and wish to be with him again. We are guaranteed that we'll be with him one day. But we see here her fundamental faith was essential, but her living faith was down. There are times when God wants to see a living faith in your life and see God work in your life and meet needs and do things. And He teaches us and we're confused what He wants for us. At this moment, Christ would want to show that He is God in the presence of death, that He defeated death, hell, and grave, and Lazarus will come forward. He, she wanted, he wanted to see her faith be vibrant, dynamic, moving. And acting and being a fellowship, being worship, not to be focused on the future. Yes, we know our doctrines and our teachings are truths, but when we walk with God daily, talk with God daily, pray with God daily, spend time with God daily, trust His promises daily, see God do miracles daily, do signs and wonders, you can see your life as vibrant, bubbly, living for the Lord. Less complaining, more praising, and all that kind of stuff. Can you see the picture there? This is Yes in America. This is no. Yeah? I think that's Yes in America. There's a bobblehead dog no, one. I get dizzy, but I hold on. Now. The point is this Martha was confused. Jesus, she understood scriptures and teachings, but Jesus would do something greater at that point. At that time. She's going to bring his brother back to life. What a miracle. What a miracle. And the last thing is this. Not only Jesus' compassion, Martha's uh, complaining, and Martha's confusion, but Jesus' claim. Verses 25 and 27. It makes it, he claims, makes a statement. This fifth I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He makes this claim. Jesus makes a great claim. Being resurrection and life. It doesn't, it's kind of interesting. He doesn't, um, 
day of the resurrection life. He doesn't talk about he can bring people back to life. He is. It's a person. He takes it more personal in the sense that I am the resurrection and the life. It doesn't mean I give resurrection and give life. I am the resurrection and life. Remember the word I am refers to uh, being God, uh, Yahweh. Uh, that's what Moses meant with uh, in Exodus. I believe it was chapter 3. And he spent time with God. God said, I am that I am. That's it for this reference. It is, I am God. I am that I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He is the one who gives and sustains life. He is the one who res resurrects and restores life. He's the one who controls our life. He's the one who allowed us to be born in this world. Mamas and daddies can help. But he's also the one who takes us out of this world when it's the right time. He is in control. He's the resurrection and the life. All, we exist because of him. Nothing exists apart from his will or his plan. It's only through him. There's several verses in scripture. I was going to say, say a few of them for you. It's a reference to him being the life of us. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1 4. For as the Father hath life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in himself. John 5 46. I come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He that has the Son has life, but he has not the Son, God has not life. Jesus is the life. He is God. He's our resurrection. In our life. <clears throat> but what's the key? Jesus died the resurrection and the life. He who what? He who what? We want to go back and read our script. Believes. That's right. He who good, good job. Who got that? Give him a cookie. He who believes in him has life. He who believes that he may die shall live. That's the key. Believe in what? Believe in me. Not me. Jesus. So a person to have life, they have to believe in Jesus. Who he is. He is the resurrection, the resurrection and life. He is God. He is supreme. He is in control of our lives. <clears throat> This believer who has passed from this world, you have a loved one who's passed from this world, and they're not in a conscious state. They are not uh, in a deep sleep, locked in a compartment somewhere, not in a uh, floating around in a fluffy cloud. Even the believer is fully alive. He lives in heaven, or she lives in heaven, and in this other world, and it's the same presence, the same day as we are. They're in this, and they're in the uh, in spiritual world, in the presence of God. Matter of fact, the Bible said there, and he shall, said, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives, believes in me, shall never die. So it says never die. We may never die. The Bible talks about once, first time it's our last breath. They believe in Jesus Christ. They take the last breath here. They enter their heaven. It's put in their eyes. Split the second. They're breathing in the presence of God. Their life as well. Matter of fact, there's an only, the only difference is this there'll be a perfect body and perfect life. You understand all of God's purpose and plan, and you can experience the presence of God like never before. A person doesn't die, they die physically in this body, but they're alive and well in the presence of God. I believe. But there is a condition. A person must believe. And what does he say to Mark? He says, do you believe? Do you believe? Let me ask this question this morning. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that uh, he defeated death and the grave? Do you believe that he raised Lazarus from the tomb from the grave four days? After all the things are down out. After all the world and everybody else has counted it out over and over again, God did the supernatural to something that was natural, dead, 
he did a supernatural miracle and did something that is hard to believe because of faith. She said, yes. She said, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. And there's three things. He said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one, the Jesus, the Son of God. And the third day says this, that Jesus is the one who was sent into the world by God. She had a closer faith that experience with God that day. First, she came to complain that I think I see her started to worship because of her experience and God showed her the resurrection of life. Do you believe? Father, we come to you this morning to thank you again. Thank you that you're the resurrection of life. Now, we don't want to face death. We, don't, we want to live and enjoy life and be with family and friends and see our children grow up and our, 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 us grow up and be with our parents and all those things. But unfortunately, uh, we all are facing death so until you return. And the only thing that matters in this world is our relationship with you that we believe that you are God. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. If you're here today, you don't believe what you want to today. Come on this side and pray with you and share with you the plan of salvation. Maybe you're here today and you trust God, but you have that limited faith. You believe in salvation, you believe in God can do things, but you don't give God 100% control. You still kind of hold back. And you still kind of do your own thing at times. Give it to God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? We have music to play and ladies and gentlemen. God speak to you today. Come. Pray. Go to the altar. Have you got someone to call to Jesus? Pray for me. Pray for this church. Have you come join the church? Have you made a decision to accept Christ? Do it today. Now is the day of